My guest today is Kevin Indig. He is VP of SEO and Content Marketing at G2, formerly G2 Crowd, and uh, mentors startups in marketing at the German Accelerator in San Francisco. Previously, he ran SEO at Atlassian, Search Metrics, and Daily Motion. Kevin is also the publisher of the TechBound newsletter and host of the TechBound podcast. Welcome, Kevin. Great to have you on the show. Thanks. It's my honor and my pleasure. Man, you are impressive. Um, <laughs> seriously, your CV is like reads like uh, the the perfect C CV of an SEO um, um, expert. If I look at like your SEO lead at G two Atlassian, Search Metrics, Daily Motion. Let's start there. I mean, how do you keep evolving? How do you learn? Like, what's your process of reinventing yourself to keep performing at such a high level? Thank you, first of all, for the kind compliments. And I think it's a combination of several things. I think in one part, I have a very deep curiosity. My 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 personality is very is very curious in general, you know, I really like to figure things out. I like to, I love to learn. It, it sounds weird, you know, because I, I was never in high school. I was okay. In college, I was good, but not great. You know, so in school, I was never standing out that much, but um, I would say six to seven years ago in my mid twenties, I started this craving for information. And I think it's because I found myself in an environment that I really enjoyed, that I was really passionate about. So to me, you know, all of this is 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 joy and and passion, and um, it's not. It, most of the time, it's not work. Of course, there's some some parts that that are work that are a bit more draining, right? But I really do what I love, and so I think that's what what helps me be efficient and learn a lot and reinventing myself is just because I love that stuff, you know. And uh, I, I I read somewhere while I was preparing for um, for this episode that you kind of try to think about how you manage your energy throughout the day. Can you can you talk a bit about that? Like wh how 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 does that look like? Yeah, you clearly did your homework. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so for me, you know. Uh, Working has always has also been an evolution. So at, at first, when I worked, I just you know um, tried to juggle things as good as I can. Right in the beginning of my career, you just you just try to survive more or less. And then you get to a level where you got things a bit more under control. Then you try to optimize more, and then you find a lot of um, productivity books or blogs or philosophies, methodologies, and then you adapt those. And then what you realize at some point. At least if when you progress throughout a company, I'm a, I'm a VP now, so I manage several teams. And then what you understand at some point is what drains your energy and what energizes you. And that is to me kind of the, the, the pinnacle of productivity and efficiency is when you can balance these two, when you can you know, um, deliberately, deliberately choose work that energizes you because you know that it's followed by something that drains you. And that to me has been the most helpful methodologies of all of them out there um, because I found that in times when I'm energized, I'm twice as productive, maybe five times as productive as in times when I'm drained. So I, I kind of learned, and I'm still learning a lot of this, um, but I kind of learned, you know, what work uh, drains me. You know, it's mostly meetings, for example, and then mm. sol like um, solitude and deep work really energizes me, but also conversations like the one that you and I have can be really energizing, right? So there is a lot of nuance, there are lots of details, but uh, once you understand it, you can plan your day accordingly. And for me, it works much better than trying to, for example, batch all the work, which is one methodology where you like batch all meetings in the morning, and then you have deep work in the evening, or you have other types of work where you like have deep work days and meeting days. I tried all of these things. But now I try to like mix draining and energizing work and that, that really works well for me. So when you say you mix draining and energizing work, so are you deciding during the day or like are you planning your day because you know yourself very well um, or are you like deciding um, or are you just kind of going with the flow, like just how you feel in the moment? Yeah, I, I plan as much as possible. Um, and, but then as a manager, your time is also, 
uh, and heavy demand. So, you know, you start to, to block your calendar more. I defend my time rigorously, but sometimes there's, it's just no way, right? Sometimes you have to have these urgent meetings or in the moment meetings, and then you just got to, you know, uh, uh, take it and, and, and uh, improvise as good as possible. But I tend to plan my week out very much. I tend to block a lot of time on my calendar for deep work because I know it's energizing me. Um, and, uh, I try to front load more of the draining and complex tasks earlier in the week and then have a bit more energizing stuff later in that week. And that works pretty well because it gives you a buffer, right? If things don't mm-hmm. go as well, if you have a delay on an important task or something, you have the rest of the week to, to catch up. So these are some ways that I kind of structure my week as good as possible. Mm-hmm. This is really interesting since this is a podcast also for growth leaders, it's one thing that struck me and that I connected with is also, I think somewhere I I wrote down a quote here that you said like, weekends are for recharging, stepping back, serendipity and looking at the bigger pictures and um, weekdays are for executing, being in the weeds and pushing. So it's, it you, you also have like that sense of recharging on the weekends versus, you know, there is this like, workaholic ten- um, tendencies out there to like, you know, work as much as possible to get as much as possible done. Can you talk a bit about that as well? Like, how do you manage that? Yeah, I love that you bring this up because I have a very specific opinion and probably not everybody agrees with me on that. But I think there is a lot to be found in seasonal work. So to me, it's not a question of go hard all the time or go hard none of the time, right? For me, I want to work more like a movie director who has a specific project that is very intense and then they take some time off, prepare the next project. Now, that is not always possible in a work environment, right? But even in work environment, we have season, we have summer, we have like winter holidays and at G2, for example, also previously at Lassen, we knew exactly when the intense times were and when it was a bit more laid back. So to me, you know, I try to go really hard during the intense times and then, you know, step, step back a lot during the more laid back times, right? I think that's, that's something that works much better for me. Um, I, I also don't really believe in work-life balance. I think there's a, a, sort of, a certain integration. Um, and I, you know, when I feel like I need to recharge, then I want to take it no matter whether it's the weekend or the week, you know, then I just like slow work down to a minimum base that I can sustain. And then other times, you know, when I'm energized, like I want to, I want to maximize that potential, right? I want to work as hard and, and as much as possible. That being said, first of all, I, I generally, again, I enjoy work. So I cannot speak for someone who maybe does not have that luxury, right? I'm very grateful for the luck that I have to be doing what I love and to even be sitting at a desk all day, right? And not, you know, uh, do much more uh, physical labor. Um, so I think, you know, generally it, it doesn't have to be that one-sided. I think in the, in the grand scheme of that conversation, the hustle culture or not, I don't think we have to make it so black and white. I think there's a lot of gray. I think when you figure out when you're most efficient and what you are best at, you also maximize your output. So again, like to me, it's, it, there's a lot more nuance. There's a lot more know yourself and there's a lot of, um, when do you need to hustle and when do you need to recharge? And after working for over 10 years, I think I, I slowly understand how far I can push myself, when I can push myself, and when I have to take a step back. Mm-hmm. Why I said why I'm connecting to this as well is because it's something that I learned for myself as well. I mean, it's like I look at it in a way of when you, you know, sometimes when you get that tingling, like, that you have momentum right now and you know if you drop things and and sprint it you know something great can happen and um to actually use those times to you know hustle if you want and and really give it all and then having you know after you you call it seasons you know um wh- however long that season might be it can be a month can be 3 months and then, but also taking the time to afterwards recharge. I, I connected to that a lot because I think it's it's really important to take the time to do that. Also for 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 the sole purpose of just taking a step back. And how you how you said it in in, in the quote that I read before, 
you know, looking at the bigger picture and and gaining the clarity as well that you need in order to 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 work on the things that actually matter. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a natural rhythm of life. It's push, push, push. And then you grow when you unwind. It's the same in, mm -hmm. in training and working out, right? It's the same in uh, in other economic situations. It's the same in SEO. It's like or marketing where you launch campaigns and then you let the campaign grow and you let it slide and you let it go, right? So that's how I, I structure more and more of my life. Uh, and I totally agree with you. When you have a mental on something, maximize that momentum. There's nothing worse than being inspired or being you know, really deep into something and then having to switch and having to step out of that. You kill totally. your flow. And that I, you know, I, I learned that the hard way. Before we go a little bit into your, your professional life, one thing, it was, it, it, it was quite fascinating that I, I really, I saw a few concepts that you talked about um, that, that where I think really similarly, and one thing um, that I have actually um, on on my wall here in 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 a way that you said as well is, you know, you are seeing pain as a teacher, and you know, you kind of talked about how it's comforting because you either succeed or you learn, and I think that's just it. Once you kind of realize that, it just takes all of this negativity away. And you can just focus on, you know, your your best work every day. And then you see, you know, either you either you fail and then you learn something, or you succeed and um, you learn something as well, and um, and you uh, you get a reward for it. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. probably one of the biggest life, life sorry life lessons that I that I learned, and it's so powerful, right? I apply it every day because I would I would say almost every day do you come into a situation where you you there's something painful, right? And it doesn't always have to be super painful. Something is also just like a little annoyance or a little something that doesn't sit quite well. But there's always something to be taught. And I, by, by the way, I learned this concept from, first of all, the Stoics, but also from Ray Dalio, who, read a, who wrote a great book called mm -hmm. um, Principles. And one of his core concepts is this idea of um, pain and reflection equals progress. And that's how I really try to look at everything and anything. We're also very well um, educated in the methodology of conscious leadership at G2. Um, I just recently discovered this last year, and I'm eternally grateful for the company to, to show me that. But it's basically a management training. And one of the ideas is also that certain emotions can signal you something. So fear, for example, is a signal that something... Um, isn't isn't done, or something isn't you know um, isn't really uh, handled the right way, and maybe we have to let something go, right? So, uh, and anger is a signal that something has to be destroyed or something has to has to change. So, it, it gets a you know it, it sounds very fuzzy at first, but it's actually very smart because when you understand your reaction to something and you look at your emotions, it can really tell you about how you can better handle them, right? So say, for example, you get really hard feedback at work. And at first, your reaction, a common reaction is fear, right? Like I, I might lose my job or I'm not good enough or, you know, there's all sorts of stories that you would tell ourselves. But it can also be a very helpful signal that, you know, just tells you, hey, maybe there's something you have to do. And I think when you go to the ground of that, when you explore that, you always come out better at the end of it. Sometimes there's an irrational fear and you just realize you're, you're scared for no reason at all. Sometimes it helps you to discover something that you didn't want to accept in the first place or so, right? So this idea of pain being a teacher, I felt many times in my life and many different things. And usually pain was a better teacher for me than success because we humans tend to be lazy and we tend to, you know, uh, not reflect on success. But in fact, you know, if you actually look at some of the best professionals and you, you really see this in poker, some of the best poker players, even when they win some of the big tournaments, they reflect a lot on why and what got them there. They don't just take it for granted, mm -hmm. right? So I think there's a, there's a human bias that says, I'm successful because I'm great which is not always the case. You know, sometimes there's luck, sometimes there are other circumstances. Uh, and I think when we just get into a habit of reflecting whether it's good or bad, we evolve much, much faster. That's the thing, right? And also not taking the failure personal um, because I feel like if we don't reflect upon it, 
it feels so personal, you know, it feels like it yeah. happened to you, you know, <laughs> and yes. And I think, and I think, just in the sake of evolving, and and what I mentioned in the very beginning, you know, you kind of reinventing yourself because that's kind of what you have to do. You you constantly change. It's it's almost a necessity. And if you constantly take stuff personal, it it, it kind of hinders you from f from learning. I feel it totally does. Uh, it's very easy to take personal because we all tell ourselves stories. Sure all the time, right? And uh, I think a lot of that is ingrained in, in childhood. Uh, and sometimes it's, you know, the the, the fear of, of not um, pleasing your parents or not getting respect. Sometimes you're disappointed in yourself and you think you're a failure, right? So it's all this kind of stuff that's that's coming in between. And don't get me wrong, you know, like when I encounter failure, my first reaction is not, oh, fantastic, I'm learning right now. My first reaction sure. is <laughs> emotionally, I have to overcome that. But then give me 24 hours and I'll come back and I'll be energized mm -hmm. and optimistic. And I learned a lot of that from my parents who showed me that behavior from when I was a, 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 you know, a very small, a small child. Um, but it's a, it's, an, it's a mindset and an attitude for life that will help you be successful in everything, right? It also dep depends on how you define success. But uh, if, usually if you progress, right, if you move forward, it doesn't matter how slow, you usually get closer to your goal. So uh, I just really try to embrace it. I remind myself every day. And so far it's worked. How do you, I mean, can you talk a bit about, you said, you know, you, you're managing several, several teams at G2. Like what is, what does, maybe let's back, a little, back up a little bit. What does G2 do and how does your role fit into it? Um, because it sounds like if you're managing several teams that, Leadership is a big part of that. Yeah, one hundred percent. I would even say I spend my time currently managing ninety percent and ten percent executing. Right, so I'm pretty much most of the time I'm managing people. G two is a a marketplace for B two B software. What we're basically building is the Amazon for B two B software. Right, where you get reviews, you can compare products, you can eventually buy certain solutions. We have you can buy and sign up for some of so, uh, uh, our solutions or solutions on our marketplace, but not all of them. And we're we're building our company towards that. We're about almost four hundred people strong with a couple offices around the world. Um, and G two started about eight, seven to eight years ago. Um, with the mission to make the software buying process more transparent, more efficient, and just simply better, right? Because it's it's weird that you can. I just bought something this morning from Amazon, right? Like one click, you read the reviews, and it's it's a no brainer. You want to buy this product, and it's probably going to be good. In software, it's not that transparent at all. Uh, you have this one side where you can buy freemium products or sign up for freemium products, try them out, see if you really like them, and there's no big cost. But then you also have enterprise software, which is a very intransparent process. And it's a, it's a long hassle to get something. And then it's complicated and complex. Not all of the software, right? But I'm sure everybody listening to this is pretty familiar with what I'm talking about. So we're setting out to change this. And my role in a nutshell is to bring buyers to our marketplace. And I do that by leading SEO and content marketing teams because those are our biggest channels. We do have a, a sales team, but most of the buyer side is, uh, of course, coming from inbound marketing. And then we have the, the software vendor side. And this is how we make money, by the way. We're not a pay-to-play space. We sell information to software sellers. So uh, we have a product called Buyer Intent, where we tell software sellers or vendors, for example, um, what kind of person came to check out their profile which company they're working for, if they might be interested in actually acquiring software. So we're connecting the software sellers with the software buyers. Um, and then we provide a lot of reviews, comparisons, alternatives to really help buyers. But that's, that's not actually what we do. And how did, you, how did you arrive here? I mean, this is a pretty substantial role. I mean, as you say, like, it's basically the main marketing channel and you are... Um, um, orchestrating the whole thing. So can we back up a little? Like, wh how did you get into SEO and what were sort of the the main learning pillars that got you to where you are? Also with the hindsight of, of, of the listeners maybe being at the position of where you were five, ten years ago. Yeah, absolutely. So I originally got into SEO through computer games. Uh, I was an avid gamer as a kid. Um, and that's, you know, to, to close the loop on the curiosity part, um, I used to 
take a take apart computers. I used to tune and upgrade my com- uh, computers myself, and um, so I was really very much in that space. And then I played a lot of online games once broadband internet was um, uh, available in in uh, Europe and Germany, and. I was the guy to figure out how to make a website because we needed a website to participate in tournaments. And so then I understood, I taught myself very basic HTML and CSS. Mm-hmm. It really wasn't pretty at the point at that time. You know, I used to... Uh, I remember. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> oh man, that was a, a crazy time. I used to uh, slice Photoshop designs um, and then code them into tables and then hard code text. And it was really nasty. Uh, but yeah, that's how we built websites back then. And it, it kind of sparked my curiosity as so many other things. And, you know, when I, when I reflect on that time, I used to go on online forums and just like really like spend nights and nights digging through these forums, searching for my answers, learning, trying things out. And then at some point I wondered where are people coming from that visit our website? Cause I saw in our analytics that there were people on our site. And then I discovered that there's this thing called a search engine and the concept and search engine optimization. And again, it was very hacky back then. You know, it was really dark magic and gaming search results. And then um, I, you know, I went to college and then I had this professor who was a who taught e-commerce, which was very, very new at the time. I mean, this was 2007, 2008. And um, he fascinated me for this idea called SEO. And he talked, he told me about this guy who is in a, one of the best affiliates in Europe and he's being invited by Vodafone to like a reindeer race in Antarctica and all this crazy type of stuff, right? And you <laughs> like really idolize this guy. And then I, there's a, there's a story to be told about, you know, how I reached out to this guy as well and, uh, and wanted to be his apprentice and uh, uh, yeah, embarrassed myself a little bit in the process. But, you know, I, I got hooked at that point and then um, I got lucky to start at a uh, consultancy in Germany that uh, consulted enterprise clients, uh, really big companies, you know, like uh, Singh and Bosch and uh, Altour at the time and a couple of other really big ones. And um, I was lucky to be a trainee there and they taught me pretty much everything. And then, you know, I was on fire at that time. So uh, I, I quickly graduated from trainee to consultant and then made my way through the agency world, consulting world. And that kind of you know, fly in in the morning to a city in Europe and fly back in the evening type of stuff and suit and tie and trying to, you know, convince big boards of big companies that they need to believe this young 20-year-old guy and and invest a lot of money into their website and those kind of things. Uh, And then, you know, to fast forward, I uh, am the son of an American father and a German mother, which uh, allowed me to have a German citizenship and an American citizenship. And that got me over to the San Francisco Bay Area six years ago, where I was very lucky to be sent over by a German company called Searchmetrics, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. And I built a professional services team in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, did that for a while, then got a really great offer by a French company called Daily Motion, which is a YouTube competitor. And uh, a couple, I think it was two or three weeks after I joined the company, um, they signed a deal to be acquired by Vivendi, a huge French conglomerate. Uh, which, you know, and as a, as a result of that, uh, I worked basically most of the time on migrating daily motion and redesigning and relaunching daily motion. Uh, and then at some point they made a call to pull everybody back to Paris and France and I didn't want to go. So, uh, I joined Atlassian and thing with Atlassian is that I had consulted for them before I joined them full time. You know, I saw it, I had always done a little bit of side consulting, which I can recommend for everyone. Uh, it really gets you exposure to other sites. It you know sharpens your skills. It really helps you develop. And uh, then when it became clear that I was going to leave Daily Motion, I you know I said I, I voiced that at last in. I didn't even ask for a job. I just said like, hey, I'm you know I'm not sure if I can keep consulting. They were like, oh, hey, here's an offer. Why don't you join? I was like, yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so I did that for three years and learned a ton in the process um, until I, I realized there was no upward mobility for my specific situation, you know, which was fine. And then I felt like my time had come to an end at the company, and you know, uh, in, in a good way. And uh, then I took a couple months off. I put myself out there. I publicly said, guys, I'm like looking who's, you know, who needs someone like me. And I talked to lots of fantastic companies and eventually decided to go with G2 for, for several reasons. Awesome. 
Now this this sounds like a straight line. Now y- usually the line is not so straight. Can you can you talk a bit about like some some fuck up of yours and what you learned f- from them? Oh god, so many. I mean, the inside <laughs> it's you know the in- inside the thoughts are always connected, right? But as you said, <laughs> foresight it never is. No. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so many fuck ups, Jesus. I think you know a lot of what I learned, uh, especially during the uh, agency time, is to be to flesh things out the right way. I'm a, I'm very fast. I'm incredibly fast. I can very quickly build structures, but then filling them out, taking it all the way to the finish line, and be very deliberate. That is the skill that I really had to um, to improve over time. And so I remember there was one time in the agency side where. Uh, I was um, working on an account uh, that was a bit shaky, so they weren't, you know, that happy. They had a lot of pressure from the board, and uh, they really wanted us to to turn things around. And there was a Friday afternoon where I sent an email. By the way, I never send big emails on Friday afternoons. Uh, and I took a long weekend. I took, I think, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday as vacation, so I was going to be gone for a little bit. And I, I don't recall exactly what the content of the email was, but uh, I think it was some sort of like a like a strategy summary or some sort of next steps. And I was um, I wasn't you know I, I didn't pay enough attention, and I accidentally put someone um, as a receiver on that email from a different company. Uh, and I think I even forgot to mention one really important point. I sent that email out and completely exploded. They came back super unhappy and. You know, they were like, who's this guy from another company on this email thread with sensitive information? And, you know, this is not fleshed out. So that really, really backfired me. And I was very lucky that I had a, a boss who, you know, who pulled me out, who stepped in, who who helped me with this, you know, who calmed them down. We turned the account around. It went all fine. And in the end, we really helped them. But that was just one situation where I completely messed it up. It was all my fault. And it, it was because I didn't take the time to double check things, to make sure everything was okay. Uh, I just wanted to be fast because I thought fast was good. Uh, and then there were other times where I made the wrong call on certain things. And, uh, you know, and I still sometimes make mistakes. You know, it's, it, it happens on a regular basis. And I try to minimize the impact of those mistakes. And I really try to reflect, as we mentioned before, on what led to the mistake in the first place, right? It's often the root cause versus symptom problem. Mm-hmm. You think that, oh, this was, you know, uh, a certain... Uh, uh, reason for that mistake, but what is the actual root cause, right? Is it that you wanted to just get this done very quickly? Is it that you didn't care about it? Is that you didn't know something, right? And did you just, did you not, did you want to just not accept that? So um, nowadays I reflect on my uh, mistakes much, much more, but they still happen. Sure. I think to everyone, how how do you, how how many, out of curiosity, how many people are on your teams like in total yeah we had almost i have almost 30 um I, uh, and so we when i started at g2 i think i had 35 and then unfortunately went through a couple of rifts where i had to let some people go and uh, now i'm hiring again so uh it was a bit of a fluctuation but that was another you know situation where you go through a painful process and you have to work on seeing how this is a lesson for you, how this can teach you something in the moment, right? How you can endure that. But it's, yeah, it's around 30. And um, can you can you talk a bit about like the, the team breakdown? Like what what are the roles like? And, and, and also how did you maybe arrive at that team structure? Yeah, that's a great question. Because I did a lot of work on that over the years or over the year. So only one and a half years. Uh, and so when I started G2, we had, I had three teams. Um, there was an SEO or a technical SEO team, a content team, and a link building team. And then over time, we restructured that. And now it is two distinct teams, uh, one for SEO, one for content marketing. And we also changed a lot of our practices, right? We don't do hardcore link building anymore. It's much more relationship building, playing the long game type of stuff, um, and I build a lot of bridges between my teams, but also between other teams that are crucial to our success. So in a nutshell, I have two teams and the most of the headcount or most of the uh, uh, people live in content marketing. Um, but uh, I'm building out the SEO team as well. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been a lot of effort went into uh, streamlining processes, not 
adding too much process, right? We're not at that stage yet. We're still, I would say, some form of startup, but at the same time, setting more barriers and boundaries that, that guide people in the right direction. Yeah, I think it's a, I, I think it's a common um, issue that a lot of CMOs and, and VPs and head of marketing face. You know, how, how do you actually structure the team? But how, like, who, who are your direct reports? You know, I mean, how, uh, how, how do you structure that? Yeah, that's, a, that's another fantastic question, uh, question because I had way too many direct reports when I started and that's just overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So I, it, it was a super flat, uh, sorry, uh, super flat structure when I started. And then I, um, uh, I kind of uh, built more of a pyramid type of structure where now I, in a nutshell, I have two direct reports. I'm still looking for an SEO Great. director. So uh, I'm filling in for that role, which means that technically I have four direct reports. But in the long run, it is going to be two direct reports, one director of content marketing and one director of SEO um, and again, I'm still trying to fill that role. And then I think it's a, it's a much, much easier process. To be fair, though, I think what's really important, what, what an important lesson that I learned is that even though you have a set amount of direct reports, as a manager of manager of managers, you always want to make sure you regularly check in with uh, everybody on the team. You don't just you know, narrow it down or silo it to work with the direct reports because you'll lose the oversight of the team. You'll lose the, the, the feeling. Exactly. The feeling of what's really going on and also how the direct reports of your direct reports feel, you know, like it's an, it's an important loop to close. And um, maybe let's start with the direct reports. Like, do you run one-on-ones? And if, if so, how do you run them? What do you see as your value that you're adding? Yeah, uh, I do run one-on-ones. I also run mentoring sessions. And um, in terms of the one-on-ones, there are a couple of things that have to be checked and then other things that are more, uh, more free flow. So um, we're always going over stuff like um, things that are going well, things that are not going so well. How can I support you more? Um, and those are staples in one-on-ones that help us to really you know, uh, build a space in which you can bring up problems. You know, I think that's, that's one thing that I learned from one-on-ones that if you don't build the space, problems tend to not come up as much, right? So I, I always expect something that's not going so well, how, however minuscule it is. Um, and then the value that I'm trying to add is to create alignment throughout the company. That is super, super important because without alignment, none of my teams can succeed. I can succeed. Also alignment within my organization, right? Within my team, between the teams about goals, all that kind of stuff. I'm also trying to, uh, my, my value add is also to see if uh, some of my direct reports need more resources, need more uh, clarity or more uh, help with something. Um, and then also how I can bring up successes from my teams to the very top of the company or escalate problems as well, right? So in a, in a lot of cases, I'm a, in my function, I'm a supporter, I'm, uh, you know, someone to create alignment, clarity, um, and building bridges. You know, I think that's what most of management and especially good management is about, right? Clear goals, clear execution, taking care of problems, and then enabling people and developing them as well, right? So this is, I would say, the, the, the last piece of value that I add is I try to, to help people be exposed to the right projects, to help people see which skills they need to develop. And also help people to find their right path. You know, not everybody wants to be a manager. Not everybody uh, wants to be a specialist or a generalist. So I try to steer people in the right direction and mentor them along the way. Mm -hmm. We'll come to the last part um, a little bit later in the conversation as well. In terms of goals, like how do you set goals for yourself? And um, how do you also break them down uh, to your team? So that you have this alignment that you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Really good question. So first of all, all of my goals basically come from the company's goals or are broken down from the company's goals. We follow the B2 mom uh, methodology that Salesforce made very popular where we have our vision, um, outcomes, mission, hurdles, uh, and so on. 
Um, and once these are defined for the year, I then break my goals down to help us achieve those V2MOM, right? Those big company goals. And from there, I break things down into quarterly goals, into team goals, and then into personally goal, into personal goals. And I also try to leave some wiggle room just, you know, to, to pivot or to change things along the way. Um, but that's basically how it breaks down. And we use the OKR methodology, the objectives and key results to, um, you know, meet on a monthly basis, quarterly basis, set quarterly goals, measure how, or understand how we measure against these goals. But then there's also, there's always like this little kind of, um, space that we, that we keep open for asks other teams, maybe another marketing team, look at the campaign and support or they're, you know, they, they do, or it's not a marketing team, sales team, they need support with something else. So I think it's in marketing you always have a split between proactive and reactive work. Uh, last thing we, we followed a system called integrated marketing where every quarter we would basically block two days of calendar and all sorts of stakeholders would come to their asks. We would plan them out appropriately. And then the rest of that capacity was for more proactive things, right? And, and help supporting our goals. Um, so I think it comes back to whether marketing plays a supportive function or how it's, how it's basically set up. And then also whether the company is a product-led growth company or whether it's sales growth or you know, uh, a different model or some hybrid of that. And how do, like, what metrics are you reporting on and, and, and to whom probably as well? And then, and then how do those get shared? Because I think that's a, that's a part that we don't often talk about as well. And um, I'm, I'm really curious how, how you handle that. We sit in marketing. So I report directly to the CMO. And um, the main metrics or main KPIs I'm looking at are basically organic traffic, um, total traffic, and the conversions from organic traffic. It really depends on the site that you're looking at. We have a couple of different sites under the same domain. So we have, for example, www.g2.com, which is our marketplace. We also have learn.g2.com, which is basically our, our content hub uh, where we create educational content and so on. So it depends on the site when it comes to KPIs. But um, those are the main ones that I'm looking at. You know, there's obviously a lot more nuance when you look at specific projects. But the way that I report them is mostly through Confluence. And so I got to know Confluence added last year, of course. Um, and for those who don't know what it is, it's basically like a like an internal wiki, if you will, or something like an intranet, you know, um, where you can store information, documents, uh, communicate, and collaborate. And uh, I'm a huge fan of Confluence and just documentation in general. You know, also my personal life, I take a humongous amount of notes uh, and, and and love this idea of building my my digital brain. And uh, I, did, I did the same for the company. So I brought Confluence to G2 and we adopted it as a company. And now we report most metrics on Confluence. So every company, sorry, every uh, team has their own space on Confluence. And then we have some shared spaces where we collaborate. And the cool thing about Confluence is you can comment, not just, you can also inline comment, right? Not just at the bottom of the page. Um, and then you can refine things together. You can tag people and, and, and really create that alignment. So that's how I report metrics, but that's also how I create alignment. Mm -hmm. I think that's super important because uh, if you give, I mean, what I often, uh, what I most of the time see is kind of loose presentations, you know, kind of decks that get <laughs> sent around and, yeah. and it's really hard to connect the dots between the different um, departments. Um, but also like how, how you mentioned, you know, maybe even be, uh, within marketing itself, um, getting the alignment without having this visibility. One thing that, if we talk already about visibility, one thing that I learned during my own career is the importance of actually selling the marketing department within the company. Is there anything that you do in that regard? Um, how do you how do you think about that? And also, like, mm, what kind of formats do you use? Absolutely important. I first learned the importance at Atlassian where SEO was new to the company. They had seen very strong product-led growth and viral growth for 15 years and then came to the point where they're like, okay, what else can we put on top? And so the company was receptive to SEO, but we were chronically under-resourced from the beginning. And I think a lot of people can relate to that. And um, it took, you know, I, I realized at some point that 
my biggest impact comes from educating the company and the people who can then make an SEO impact. Right? So instead of me trying to come with all these guidelines and rules and projects for writers, designers, and engineers, I set out on a campaign to educate them. I ran many workshops to teach them what SEO is, how they can incorporate that into their work without having to use any crazy tools or going crazy, right? But simple checklists, small little things. And those compounded over time. That makes it also really hard for you to measure your specific impact because you can't just you know, track it on a dashboard or something. But uh, it is the best way to scale SEO throughout an organization because SEO is so highly dependent on other teams. True. And so when I sell marketing or when I sell SEO within uh, companies or now within G2, one of the most important things is to show a close feedback loop. Like we did this and that's the result. We tried that and it did not work. We tried this and it didn't, and it did work. So when you show people what works and what doesn't, not just from other blog articles or from you know things that other people did, but what you have done specifically in the company, you start to gain trust, you start to get more resources, you start to become more successful. So you have to build your house on small little stones, which is why it's so important that when you join a company to, to, to try to find some quick wins and small wins because they will build credibility throughout the rest of your of your tenure at the company. And if you miss that window of opportunity, it becomes exponentially harder. And if you can tie that to a dollar number, that's the jackpot. And that's where most SEOs are missing the mark. And that's where most marketers fail is they cannot tie what they do to a dollar amount. And it's not easy, but it's absolutely crucial and necessary. So I would say, you know, when you join a company, or even when you have been at a company for a long time, you don't feel you can move things as much as you want to and execute to the degree you want to, try to find ways to tie things to a dollar amount. And if you say, you know, you're sharing results, how specifically do you do that? Like, I mean, you mentioned workshops, um, but then the result part, like, are you sending out, you know, stories via email or like what specifically do you do? Yeah, there's a multitude of tools that I learned over time. Uh, one of them are memos, where I would just on a sometimes like frequent basis send out memos with status reports, and those kind of things. But we also do a lot of very specific testing. So I'm blessed that we have uh, data scientists and statisticians at G2 who really helped me set up a, a, a statistics proof test or experiment that we then run, that we then evaluate, and then I share these results with the company sometimes in presentations, in company-wide meetings, and, and often also in, in, in senior leadership team meetings where then present, mm -hmm. right? So uh, that's one way. And then, you know, it's also, uh, there's also a lot to be gained from setting goals and then either achieving them, not achieving them, and then reflecting on why and sharing those reflections with the rest of the company. And of course, especially your main stakeholders. But just being able to show them, hey, this is what we thought when we set that goal, and this is what actually happened in a very, you know, in a very detailed manner that does a ton for you because it shows everybody that you can, first of all, you do reflect on that at all. Second, you can reflect on your mistakes. And third, which is a, a theme in our conversation here. Uh, and third, you know, that you uh, can do better if you underachieve or if you miss the goal next time because you know what happened. So it can be very simple and it can be, you know, the, the format doesn't matter as much. It can be a Google Doc, it can be a Confluence page, it can be a presentation, but that you do it and that you advocate for it and that you evangelize is much more important. So proactively schedule those meetings, ask for time to present, ask for time to, to present to the CEO, right? Uh, and, and show what you're doing, show your work, show your results. It's very uncomfortable, because SEO is really complex, growth is really complex, and most things actually fail. But I truly believe that if you can show why you failed, it's worth much, much more than not talking about it at all. And you mentioned, I mean, especially SEO, I think growth in general, but, but, but especially SEO is super interlinked with so many other things that are happening at the company. And what really interests me is like, how do you work together with sales, product, I don't know, customer support, where, where do you interface and how have you learned to better interface um, in, in, the, in, the, in the span of your career? Yeah, I learned that a lot because I didn't do it at all in the beginning. And so now we have regular alignment meetings uh, almost on a weekly basis. 
um, I practically create ties between also my direct reports and their direct reports and, and people on the same level and other teams by proactively asking them to schedule a weekly meeting or a bi-weekly meeting, share results, uh, and uh, um, set common goals. So I, I kind of mix two together, right? The first one is common meetings and just a space to discuss and, and, and converse. The second is to have common goals. That's one of the most powerful ways to create alignment between two different teams that should collaborate. Give them the same goal and they'll figure out a way. Um, and that's one thing that I learned over time is I always thought that you have to exactly describe the workflow of how these teams should collaborate and really write it out and, and, and set the tone there. But sometimes it's just enough to give them a common goal, put them in a room, and they'll figure out a way to get there. Right? So I think it can play a lot with incentives uh, to create alignment. And um, uh, then there are, of course, the, the common kind of challenges that we all face at work with human interaction. You know, there's so sometimes a little bit of tension, some stories and some things that come up. But um, I think creating an alignment through the goal is some of the most important. Then having that regular communication um, and, and you know, uh, trying to for people to to find ways to collaborate. You don't have to like each other, right? You don't have to be friends and all that kind of stuff. But it's a requirement in the workplace that you find ways to even work with people that you don't like. Mm -hmm. I feel like whenever there is conflict in the workplace, it's it becomes very apparent what the leadership philosophies or lack thereof is of certain um, um, leaders. Do you have certain formalized, even if just in your head, kind of leadership philosophies, how you think about how to manage a team and lead a team that you live by or work by? Yeah, yeah, I do. And I... I'm constantly building on that. You know, I think that's where I made some of the biggest growth over the last couple of years is in uh, in my leadership and management capabilities. When it comes to conflict, uh, you know, just to zoom in on that really quickly, there is a very specific methodology that I learned uh, from conscious leadership, which is called issue clearing, where you bring two parties together and they basically state the facts of the conflict then they state how it made them feel in a nutshell, right? And the stories that they tell themselves about them, the emotions that they felt. And then you flip it around and the other person does that. Uh, and it's absolutely magical. It's very uncomfortable in the beginning, um, but you come out, I would say 99% of the time, you come out much more connected. You come out really in the clear with the person and you start to form actually these uh, really good relationships. Uh, and conflict happens on a regular basis. It is unavoidable, right? If you think about how often you get into conflict with a partner, right? Like with a romantic partner, they, you know, it's unavoidable, right? Uh, especially it's the necessary probably even in order to invo yes. evolve. It is absolutely necessary. You learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot about, a lot about the other people, a uh, person. And I, I would even argue that, that, as you said, like resolved conflicts can create fantastic teams. So that is one of my leadership philosophies, right? Is to to not shy away, but to seek that. And it does not come natural to me at all. I'm really good at avoiding conflict. I'm, I'm fantastic at that. You would be shocked how good I am at this. Uh, and it took me a lot of work to work, uh, to, to get through this and still takes a lot of work. But I do think that this in, like alignment from a, from a meta sense, right? This, this personal alignment with somebody else is really important to understand where are they at? Where am I at? To, to share your true feelings and perceptions and stories, because I think at the end of the day, you get much better. Then you start to build this super teams. And once you have a super team, you know, it will reflect in performance. And this is kind of the methodology and philosophy throughout G2. You know, we think that when you are aligned with people, when you're in the clear, when you're connected with them, you can create much, much better work than if you just, you know, come to the office. Well, not right now, right? But show up for work and just do your job and then leave. So we're very big on, on, um, on connection. Um, and, but then another, you know, philosophy is also is clarity for me. And this again is also something that didn't naturally arise from me at first, but, uh, mo I think at least 50% of problems stem from unclarity from people not knowing exactly what is the task? What is the goal? Why should we do this? Uh, and that happens on a company wide level that happens on a team level, maybe even happens on a personal level. So even when I look at it as, as an SEO problem or a management problem, I always ask myself, 
am I clear? Do I really know this? Do I know exactly what the purpose and the goal of that is? And you need to ask yourself because those things change over time. So I think by just providing clarity and connection with people, you solve almost most of the problems. But that is a giant task. So it, it, it doesn't happen overnight. This is super interesting to me. I think clarity is a huge um, benefit if you have if you have it, let's say. How do you... Can you just quickly in a few sentences describe how you arrive at clarity if you have identified the problem? Like, I think the first thing is to actually, you know, have the awareness that there is a problem. But then afterwards, like, how do you think through it in order to arrive at a, at a clear or a clarity? There is a model that I learned from Ryan Bonici, the CMO at G2 and uh, my boss and friend, I would add, uh, which is the iGrow model. And the I- iGrow is an acronym that stands for issue, goal, um, reality, obstacles, and what's next or next steps, right? Um, and it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an elegant way to step back, look at what is the problem, what, is, what am I actually trying to achieve, what are my options, and what's, you know, what, what can I do? What can I choose from? And just a simple exercise mm. helps you to put things into perspective and create clarity. I want to point out that clarity is often an illusion and more in the sense that we think we have clarity, but we often don't. And it starts on a very personal level because we make assumptions and tell ourselves stories all day long. So I, don't, I can't really put this quote together, but there was, you know, there's, there's some quote that really points out how little we truly know is 100% true. Most of the things we've heard from someone else, we've read somewhere, but if you dig down, really, you're not sure if that's really true. And that's important because if you accept that most things might not be true for, or you think they are true, but they're actually not, that is big for you. That's another big life lesson that I learned uh, in my career and my personal life is that I just, you know, most things might not be true. And it is, there, is an, there is a chance that the opposite might be true, which, by the way, also is reflected in conscious leadership, right? And if you mm-hmm. keep asking yourself that, you become way more humble. You get closer to the truth because most things are not black and white, even though you want them to be, even though it's easier, it's, it's you know, faster to process from a cognitive uh, standpoint of view. But you also make better bets because you start thinking in probabilities. And this is something that I learned from Annie Duke, a world-class poker player who wrote a book called Thinking in Bets. And she advocates this whole model of probabilistic thinking and saying, I'm 70% sure that this is true, but there's no 100% sure, right? The things that we know as humans to be true are very, very small, actually, right? We start, we start talking about physical laws and all that kind of stuff. So um, to just like leave that window open for you being wrong, you know, that is a, a major help in whatever you do, whether you look at SEO or management problems or, you know, anything else. You, I, I think... Just while you were talking, I think it's a phenomenal question to ask, like, what if the opposite is true? You know, that's a great question yeah. to ask. Um, it is terrifying, too. You know, it's yeah. like, man, <laughs> what if this belief that I had the whole time is wrong? That's tough because this starts to bite on your identity, right? Lots of our beliefs are connected to our identity, which, by the way, is a great marketing tool because if you market to people's identities, it's much more efficient than uh, you know, to, to something that they want or need in the moment. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm getting off the beaten path. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough, tough question. It comes back to this idea of learning from pain, uh, but it's a helpful tool. And I think, I mean, what you mentioned as well has a lot to do also with the kind of first principle thought, right? I mean, if you are, if you are making, I mean, you're right, the clarity is a very, it's a very elusive thing right because you it's very probable that you make an assumption on top of an assumption so <laughs> to actually arrive um at at full clarity is very 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 difficult so i think and you mentioned the the book by ray dalio principles it also helped me a lot i mean it's a super dense book so i could yeah. like i think it took me one and a half years to go through <laughs> actually um but uh, this this really left an impression on me as well it's like 
it's but but it only came up now again when you said it I and mean, it's true like how often do you actually know what's true that's uh that's a good that's a good thought i think yeah and it becomes even more freaky when you realize that sometimes the opposite can also be true at the same mm -hmm. time right that is hard to comprehend but you know we're humans we're capable of having of holding two opposing truths at the same time which i think is we're the only animals that can actually do that and um it helps you do a lot of things it helps to be more creative because sometimes the opposite of a good idea is also a good idea mm -hmm. and this is uh, you know also something that i uh learned from a book called alchemy um i don't uh Oh, I don't recall the author at the moment. Anyway, uh, but it also really helps you, again, in being more humble in your assumptions and making your bets and your projects more bulletproof. Because once you accept that the opposite might be true, you can then, you know, do something like creating red teams, right? This, this idea of uh, scheduling a meeting or allowing for a space where the only goal of a team is to take an idea apart. That's the idea of a red team, right? Like, yeah, this is what I'm thinking. That. Now awesome. fire of it. Yeah, it's, oh my, my God, it's super effective. Also very terrifying, but that's how you become successful, right? You understand mm -hmm. there's a possibility I might be wrong. So let's figure all the ways out that this could go wrong and then find mm -hmm. solutions for that. Boom, there you go. Awesome. Also, I read teams and never. that's great. Um, it's it, it it has a bit. It just reminds me of this. Just because you mentioned stoicism before, um, it reminds me a bit of this like pre mortem. You know, like how mm, yeah. how do you think about all the things that could go wrong uh, before you actually start a project? I think that's really powerful. But I never heard of it in a like professional setting where um, a team can challenge another team. That's I think that's a great um, exercise. Yeah. If we people from here a little bit towards. Um, personal branding i i see that more and more often and i think it's super helpful not only for the individual but also for the company i mean i think g2 is a great example for that um you mentioned you mentioned your boss um i mean he's all over the place and he's <laughs> i mean i can feel his energy just through linkedin yeah. um, um itself you are doing a bunch of stuff and then also i've i am now blanking on his name um he's a copyright uh, uh yeah copyright. eddie schweiner yeah exactly yeah um uh, from good co uh now i'm very good also. copy yeah, yeah very yeah. good copy yeah, exactly so um g2 has a few um of 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 these kind of archetypes of like personal branding um, aficionados, if you want, how do you like, how do you think about that? Like, how do you make it part of your career? And even more important, like, what do you recommend someone who is a marketing leader and would like to get into this? I started with my personal branding way too late. I've been in this for a bit over 10 years now and I only started two years ago. Uh, and I should have, started, should have started way, way sooner because there's so many fantastic things that come out of personal branding. It seems very shallow and narcissistic from the outside. And I get regularly flagged for this. But uh, when you actually do it, a couple of great things come to you. One of them is hiring. When you have a strong brand and a space, it is much, much easier for you to recruit top talent and bring that to the company. And that's one of the key drivers of success at a company. So just that alone helps you greatly in whatever capacity you are. Number two, you get you build better relationships with people. More people know you, you get easier in touch with people, you can learn better from other people, which has always been a huge, huge thing in my career. So that's, that's the second benefit. And then third is you push yourself out there. And that can be scary. But it can also be great because people let you know when you're wrong, <laughs> right? And we, can, we keep coming back to this idea of reflecting from pain. But once you have a personal brand, you, you just get better feedback for your ideas, for and the more. things that you do. And more, yes. Mm -hmm. And sure, it's awesome when it's good feedback and it sucks when it's bad feedback, but you learn from the bad feedback. And uh, that's that's a reality that I did not did not realize or accept when I started doing this. But now I'm a huge fan of it, right? Like you, you just you just have more surface to put yourself out, test your ideas and assumptions, and then learn from it. Um, and so I, I think, you know, everybody should build a personal brand. I also think it's a huge driver of career. 
Uh, it really helps you to make the right connections to find a great place to work at. And I think one of the smartest, best ways is is to just document what you're doing. And I stole this from uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. Uh, a lot of people have very controversial opinions about him, but I, I really focus on the things that are helpful that he puts out. And one of them is to document and not create, right? So I think especially when you're starting out, this is the perfect time for you to say, hey, I'm a beginner. I'm not sure what I'm doing, but let me share what I'm learning and what I'm seeing out there. And, you know, mm-hmm. you, that's a perfect space because you're basically reflecting on what you're learning. You get feedback for that as well. Most of the times you learn faster, you develop faster, and you start building your personal brand in the process. Uh, now, I still try to, to document a lot, but it gets harder over time. And so I create much more and try to come up or come up with original ideas. So, um, you know, I think one of the easiest ways is to build an email list. Even easier is to build a blog. And uh, I think one of the biggest challenges is to overcome that initial fear that, you know, the whole world is watching you right now and will judge you if you make a mistake. And that just doesn't happen. You know, when you start out, when you're small, uh, you know, no disrespect, but most people just won't care. And it's a great sandbox for you to experiment, to find your style, to find your thing, um, and then you just start. So, yep, huge fan of personal brand. I think there's a ton of value from it. And I can recommend anybody to, to test it out. Before we go into um, one or two of your original ideas, or at least... Um um, some of the ones that I've read. One thing that really helped me, I mean, I had a similar notion in the beginning that like, okay, uh, do I really need to put myself out there? And then, um, you know, you're being charged and, and, and stuff like that. And do I really have something important to say or whatever? Um, and I forget whom I have it from actually, um, but I think he called it like the law of obviousness. <laughs> and yeah. it's it's really interesting because um, we as humans always think like everything is obvious that we know, but actually almost nothing that we know, like the, 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 if you put a Venn diagram of stuff that I know and you know, it's actually very, very little do we have in common. So ve- a lot of things that are obvious um, to me might not be obvious to you at all. And and so what this person did was basically kind of put yourself in the middle and thinking of all the people that you follow, they are ahead in your journey. Um, so you follow the people where you want to be at some point. But there is a ton of people that are where you were, you know, five years ago. And I think that helped me just a lot to for myself to define, oh, there's actually also value in that. Like I can get value from it, but in order to keep doing it, I think it's important to um, also find that you can bring value. So that helped me a lot. So that's just a little um, kind of thing that I wanted to slide in there. Yeah, it's, I couldn't agree more. I feel it on a daily basis. You know, um, I read this newsletter once a week, uh, which you mentioned in intro called TechBound. And two months ago, I added a paid tier as well which has me send out three emails a week. And, Ooh. you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot, you know, it's, it's, I enjoy it uh, greatly, but sometimes it's challenging. And sometimes I get to into a time crunch because I do have this full-time job and I do some things on the side as well. And then sometimes I'm like, okay, I have to write something for tomorrow. And then what I often revert to is something very basic. And, you know, I, I sometimes feel bad because I'm like, oh man, I'm putting this thing out that is very basic. And well, what if people who are paying for this uh, what if they're like, hey, I'm not paying for this basic stuff. You know, I want my money back. So you, you start telling yourself all, all sorts of stories. Sometimes it's the best thing I put out. I get the best feedback from these basic things. And I'm like, uh, okay, well, I don't understand this, but you're absolutely right. I think this this blindness that you develop on your own knowledge and how value can be to others is a huge problem, but should encourage more people to just go out there, put stuff, put content yeah. out there, share what they learn. I fully agree. We don't have too much time left. I think we have to do a round two. <laughs> yeah, I'm down um, for I, it. If I look at if I look at all the um, remaining um, interesting things that I wrote down, but let me quickly before we go into the into the um, into the kind of education and 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 resources, I have I have I have one question of uh, something that you wrote really recently. So I think it's also probably top uh, top of mind for you. Um, again, I quote you. Kevin says, 
the key to making content work for a startup is by creating the right content in the right format on the right channel for the right audience. And you call that content marketing fit. I think that's so undervalued. Like so many people are just putting out content, but they're not deeply thinking about just exactly what you say in this quote. Can you just quickly outline this concept and how you arrived at it? Thank you. The idea of content market fit is derived from product market fit. I'm sure everybody listening to this is familiar with the idea of product market fit, but it's basically that point when you build something that people truly love and you see organic growth, word of mouth, and this almost hockey stick type of growth. And it works really well in the startup world. And now we find ourselves in a world that is flooded with content. You know, it's easy to create content. Everybody understands the value of it. It's the driver of a lot of traffic. It can bring you revenue, leads, all the good stuff. But reality is also that the bar for good content is growing and it's getting higher and higher because there is more content. There is more competition out there and other channels are getting harder to be successful in like paid advertising. Uh, and so more companies invest in, in content, right? And I think now it's, it's an important time to go beyond just the idea of I'm researching some keywords and I, put, I write content accordingly or I just write what I'm thinking about and, and truly put that into a bigger perspective. And so I came up with this model of content market fit, which is the same idea that you create content which people love. You know, they, they share it on social media. You get organic backlinks without doing outreach. You have a high dwell time. You have many pages per session and, and scroll depth. And people really consume your content, but love it. And there are a couple of companies that found content market fit, like HubSpot, like Canva, or like First Round. And so in this article, I provide specific numbers so we can look at to understand if we have content market fit but also ways to arrive there. And some of the best ways are to you know, survey your customers and your audience, to look at the numbers, to experiment, uh, and then to see what worked in your space and how you can differentiate yourself, right? But it's also important to, to create the right content uh, according to the channel because not every channel has the same logic of content, like a YouTube video, right? That's a, a, it should be a different approach than textual content, which should be different than social media content or an email newsletter. So we need to differentiate between that as well. And then lastly, we need to make sure it fits to the brand. It fits to the product. When you look at a company like Asana, for example, they launched a uh, publication called Wavelength, and it's really aligned with the rest of the product. It's one seamless experience. There's no border between the product, between the blog, between the rest of their uh, uh, website. Right. It has the same design philosophy, it has the same tone, it has the same utility, it's very interlinked. And so I think it's, it's very clear that some companies have content market fit and others don't. It is, as always, a journey. Uh, you, mm -hmm. you hardly ever get it right from the beginning. But there are tools and methods that we can use to get there. And I think, to me, it's the absolute key to be successful in content marketing and SEO nowadays. You're bringing up, actually, that's, that's really true. I never thought about it like that. It's, we talked about before we started recording about Ahrefs. Um, and it really feels like the content almost feels like an, an extension of the product in a way. And I think that's when, you know, I am sometimes not sure am I in the product in a help article or in, in a blog post. So it's like, I think... I, I love that. And I think it's it's more people should think about it that way because then it's also not this like, as you say, you know, like like it used to be, you know, you you just type in um, um, an article um, into ClearScope and then trying to find um, um, <laughs> the perfectly optimized um, um, article, which in my, in my view, you're, you're much more an expert than I am, is, is a bit of the thing of the past anyways, because Google got a bit more intelligent. But I would I, I I just love that you put out this kind of notion, even though you're actually coming or maybe especially become uh, because you're coming from an SEO um, um, perspective and you are you're at the forefront of this. And I think um, this should be even broadcasted more. These kind of ideas. I think it's 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 completely undervalued. And 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 that's also why people don't find success right with with content oftentimes because there is so much content out there 
Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, it, it makes sense from a rational mathematical perspective. You cannot stick out when you do the same as everybody else. You can only learn from right. the principles and what makes them successful, but then it has to be different. It has to be interesting. So I'm trying to reflect that in, in all of my work, you know, uh, whether personal or HG2 uh, and or at, at Atlassian as well, you know, and so far it served me greatly. And uh, I, I try to just advocate that idea more and more in the stuff that I put out. So I want to be mindful of your time. So let's just go into um, one um, a bit broader question, um, and then we wrap up. As I sure. said, I we we have topics here for three hours. Um, <laughs> education um, and and career development. You mentioned at some point in our conversation that um, that is also important to you, and um, not only to yourself, applied to you, but also applied um, to the people that um, work for you or work. Um, in your team, how do you approach education in your career and in marketing, and how do you teach it um, to to other people? How do you encourage other people to to learn? My philosophy is that most of the information is out there, and that you can actually teach yourself in many cases, right? Unless we talk about very complex traditional fields like maybe medicine or law uh, and some of the natural sciences where you really need to, you know, you cannot discover everything from first principles in, in the same way, right? Like you cannot discover how biology works from scratch. You have to learn that from books. You have to follow a curriculum and build on, on each other. Mm -hmm. But with more of the modern disciplines, the, the traditional way of education becomes less valuable. And online marketing is at the very forefront of this, I would argue that other things like product development, maybe even sales are in the same realms. It's much more important to have a drive to learn yourself, to come into a habit of learning and reading, um, talking to other people. But the, the, the complexity with online marketing and, and SEO especially is that nobody knows the perfect path. We all rely on sharing what we learned, a bit of trial and error, um, and then some, some logical assumptions that we have to test. And so there is a lot to be gained from talking to other people. I encourage my, like, and marketing in general, we track and encourage people reaching out to other people to learn from them and have a conversation, right? So just like you and I talk right now, I learned something from this, right? I also think it's very important to write down what you learned. Again, I'm a, I'm a chronic obsessive note taker because I learned of the value, not only are you more inclined to retain information when you write it down, but you can also go back, you can look it up, you can connect different pieces of information with each other. And as I mentioned, you build your, you, you build your own kind of digital brain, right? The, the, the world nowadays is way too complex and overloaded with information for us to just keep everything in our brains. There are some exceptions, some people who are able to do this, but most are not, and I'm certainly not. So I rely on tools and those work greatly. So Seek, like having the drive and curiosity to, to, to learn for yourself, uh, documenting what you learned, talking to other people so you learn from them, and then also con consistently testing what you learned and, 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 and having this trial and error, right? It's not just enough to theoretically learn. You need to apply what you learn and practice to learn from it. And then fifth, to always be open that this could be wrong and could change over time. So you, know, you, you learn greatly from repeating experiments, tests, and seeing how things change over time. I think those are my five core pillars. What are the meta skills you think in marketing? I think the meta make skills, everything else better. I think writing. What is the, the writing is one of the biggest ones, especially that taught me greatly that I learned a, a ton from because writing is thinking to me. And if you're able to write something out very clearly, right, we come back to clarity, then you your thoughts are refined and improved. And so what I often do when I'm not clear on something is I write it out and then I quickly, I quickly find the limitations of my knowledge or where I might be wrong. Um, so I think writing, clear writing, good writing is one of the best meta skills. doesn't matter if you're a data scientist or if you're super analytical, there's no excuse to me for working on your writing skills because you work on your thinking skills as well. So that's the biggest one to me. Thanks. Um, do you have some 
resources that if somebody asks you, like I do now, um, that you that you love to share, like books or websites or people to follow, um, anything that just comes to mind right off the bat? I mean, there are so many. Um, I think there are a couple of great podcasts out there. I still listen to most Tim Ferriss uh, episodes and podcasts. Uh, I really love the Knowledge Project uh, from Farnham Street. And Farnham Street is a great blog as well. Uh, I mentioned Ray Dalio's book. Um, I really like Tyler Cowen's podcast, Conversations with Tyler, because he asks fantastic questions and he's uh, insanely smart. Um, and then there are a couple of other ones. You know, I think uh, David Perel, for example, on Twitter is extremely interesting to follow right now. Tiago Forte, this YouTuber called Ali Abdal, who does some really interesting things in the productivity space. And um, I mean, in terms of other people on Twitter, I, I, we probably won't have enough time for me to list them all. There's so many fantastic people out there. So I definitely don't do it justice. I also uh, should share my uh, Feedly feed of websites that I regularly read from. Uh, there's a cool tool that I use called Refine for Twitter um, mm -hmm. that, that kind of um, summarizes the most shared tweets of your uh, followers and the people you follow. Um, but yeah, I think that's what comes to mind most, uh, mostly. Awesome. Cheers. So now where can people find you? Yes, uh, you can find me on kevin-indig.com. That's I-N-D-I-G or just Google for Kevin Indig. You should find my name. Uh, same on YouTube. Um, and on Twitter, I'm Kevin underline Indig. And then, uh, yeah, on podcasts, you find my TechBound podcast and all that stuff that I'm putting out there. So just start with my first name and you'll explore all the rest on my website, I guess. Yes, exciting. Your newsletter as well. Sure. Newsletter awesome. Tech Bounce, you also find that on my website. Uh, or if you just Google for Tech Bounce, you'll also find that hopefully ranking number one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Kevin, thank you so, so much. It was a great conversation and hopefully to be continued because, uh, yeah, I went through like half the questions I had. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Great conversation. I'm down thank for you. number two. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks for having me. This was a fantastic conversation. Really enjoyed that. Cheers. Thank you, Kevin.